Welcome back to another IB Environmental Systems in Societies video. Today's topic is 1.3 Sustainability. This is part two of the sustainability series and we're going to explore how sustainable development is connected to the concept of environmental justice. Let's get into it. Sustainable development is defined as meeting current needs without compromising the ability of future generations to also meet their needs. It's a framework introduced in the 1987 Brundtland Report about guiding human civilization's development. It aims to maintain economic stability, social equity, and ecological integrity. The Brundtland Report is one of those things that you should definitely remember for your ESS exam. If you'll notice that the model here of sustainable development, it builds on the three P's of sustainability from our previous video. That's people, planet, and profit. But the Brundtland model of sustainable development adds two more P's, peace, and partnership. This is a holistic approach that addresses multiple aspects of human and environmental well-being. Because if people are at war, they're not going to be worried about the environment. They're focused on staying alive. If people are at war, they can't prosper. They won't earn enough money to support their families, to take care of health care, pay for schooling, that kind of thing. So in order for the three P's of those, in order for the three P's of sustainability to be achievable, we need to have peace. And in order to have peace and achieve those three pillars of sustainability, we need partnerships. Some of those partnerships are local. They might be government partnerships. They might be intra-government partnerships at a state or national level. But a lot of those partnerships are international because a lot of these issues are international in scope. Unsustainable resource use can lead to ecosystem collapse. We're going to take, it a, we're going to take a look at a few case studies to see real world examples of how this happens. You can find some more detailed videos about all of these case studies online. So this is just gonna be a quick review of all of these. The first case study is very famous and that's the collapse of the Atlantic cod fisheries in the North Atlantic. This was caused by overfishing due to improved technology in the middle of the 20th century and an increase in the size of the boats that were used. It also resulted because we didn't have great environmental monitoring, we didn't have great environmental management, so we didn't actually know how large the stock of Atlantic cod were. As local populations along the coast in fishing communities started noting that the size of fish they were catching was smaller and the number of fish that they were catching was smaller, the organizations and the government agencies that are responsible for managing this fisheries kind of ignored all of those warnings. The consequence of this is that the Atlantic cod essentially went extinct. It didn't go extinct, but it became very close to going extinct, which resulted in a fishing moratorium. And that resulted in massive job losses all along the coast. There was economic devastation because people weren't working. And because people had removed a key organism from the Atlantic Ocean food web, there was also ecological imbalance. As a result of all of these changes, we ended up with some cultural shifts along the coast. You can see in this graph of commercial cod harvesting, how it was relatively stable and only increasing slightly from 100,000 or so to 200, 250,000 or so until just after the end of World War II in the middle of the 20th century, when we saw a massive increase in the annual catch. That's as a result of that change in technology. And you'll notice that in the early 1980s, suddenly the catch dropped precipitously that's because we were harvesting or overfishing more adults than could be replaced through breeding. This diminished natural capital and it made fisheries vulnerable to collapse. And you see that that collapse happened in 1992, where it went almost to zero. Then you had the moratorium. And now you can see after the turn of the millennium in 2000, a very small increase, a very small bump in the number of Atlantic cod that are harvested every year. The next case study we're going to look at is the Aral Sea. This is an ecosystem collapse in Central Asia. It spans about five different countries, and it was caused by a massive water diversion project from the Soviet Union that was directed for cotton irrigation. Because of that, the poor, the, the poor water management resulted in about a 75% shrinkage of the sea. That increased the salinity levels in the Aral Sea tremendously. It also meant that pollution levels increased because they had nowhere to go. So the pollution concentration in the Aral Sea increased dramatically. Fish species that were adapted to the pre-saline environment became extinct. The fishing industry in the Aral Sea collapsed. 
And because the large body of water was involved in regulating climate in the area, the regional climate also changed, and that affect agriculture in the area as well. You can see in this series of maps how the Aral Sea appeared before and after. Well, actually, I guess currently. Right? This is a dramatic visual representation of the ecosystem collapse happening in Central Asia as a result of this human boondoggle. Another case study you should be familiar with is the Great Barrier Reef coral bleaching events in Australia. The Great Barrier Reef is the largest coral reef ecosystem in the entire world. As ocean temperatures rise, the oceans become more acidic, and that increased level of acidification makes it more difficult for corals to fix the calcium carbonate that their shells are made from and their skeletons are made from, and so the reefs become weaker. Agricultural runoff and pollution from land-based industries also contributed to this mass coral bleaching. The effect is that corals bleached, they died, and because they are so critical for marine food webs, you had lots of marine habitat that was lost. That meant fish populations declined, and the Great Barrier Reef is a great spot for tourism. So the tourism industry took a really big economic hit as well. Back in topic 1.1 on perspectives, we looked at influences on the modern environmental movement, and the Dust Bowl is one of the things that came up that shaped the way people think about humans' interactions with our natural world. So what caused the Dust Bowl? This is a severe drought that spanned several years. It also was a result of poor farming practices where there was deep plowing involved. Nobody was rotating crops. All of the native prairie grasses in Central North America had been removed. Their very deep root systems are what used to hold the soils in place. And when they were replaced with shallow rooted crops, anytime that there was wind and no rain, it allowed the soils to be blown away. So the effect was that you had massive soil erosion and these dust storms that you can see in this slide here. Crops failed, the agricultural system collapsed, and you had mass migration, particularly to the West Coast in California. The entire Great Plains part of the United States suffered economic devastation. This coincided with the Great Depression. And so there were long-term changes in agricultural practices. It wasn't all gloom and doom because as a result of that devastation, some of those agricultural practices led to some of the soil conservation techniques that we're gonna study later on in the syllabus. Let's transition to economic indicators and sustainable development. Some really common indicators of economic development are gross domestic product. And unfortunately, GDP often neglects the value that natural systems actually play in the economy. That's one of its big limitations. It's focused solely on the monetary value of ecological goods. It doesn't consider ecological services very well. We've defined GDP as being the monetary value of goods and services produced by a nation. This map shows that there are significant global economic disparities. You see that the darker areas have higher GDP, but how does that connect to the idea of sustainability and environmental justice? Focusing on GDP as a measure of economic progress doesn't account for environmental costs or social well-being. So it doesn't address the other two pillars of sustainability. It only accounts for the economic aspect. It doesn't consider social or ecological. This means that when we only use GDP, that can lead to unsustainable development. Green GDP is based on the gross domestic product, but it also accounts for environmental costs and it subtracts those from the GDP. So the green GDP is GDP minus the consumption of natural capital, such as soils, air, water, minerals, ores, and organisms that we may harvest. It also accounts for the cost of environmental protection. Right? Those are pollution control programs and prevention programs. It also accounts for the degradation of ecological services, such as the amount of carbon that can be sequestered by forest as we cut those forests down, perhaps the cost to health of oxygen produced by those same forests that have been cut down, soil erosion that may result from unsustainable agricultural practices, and so on and so forth. So there's a simple formula for GDP, and it's simply GDP minus consumption, minus the cost of environmental protection, and minus the cost of environmental degradation. Green GDP attempts to account for all of the environmental factors that are ignored by traditional GDP. How does sustainable development relate to this idea of environmental justice? Environmental justice is defined as the right of all people to live in a pollution-free environment and have equitable access to resources, regardless of race, regardless of gender, of socioeconomic status, or nationality. Equitable is not equal. Equitable means people get what they need, not 
everyone gets the same amount. Make sure you know the difference between those two terms. One of the events that influenced the development of the modern environmental movement was the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. We've seen this already in topic 1.1 on perspectives. This is an example of environmental injustice because it disproportionately affected low-income and minority coastal communities along the coast of Mexico. The immediate economic hardship and long-term health and environmental risks revealed inadequate safety regulations that prioritized profits of large corporations over local environmental health and the well-being of those communities along the coast where most of the environmental impacts were felt. Another example of environmental injustice is the NIMBY principle. NIMBY stands for not in my backyard. It's this idea that nobody wants to have something like a landfill near that, right? So we tend to put landfills in places where people don't have the resources or the wealth to combat that. They also don't want to be near a landfill because landfills are frankly smelly, but because they communities don't have the economic and legal representation to fight that, it means that they have the unfair burden of pollution and health risks that are associated with something like a landfill. Another case study from that history of the environmental movement is the 1984 Union Carbide Gas Release in Bhopal, India. It occurred in densely populated, low-income areas, again, underrepresented communities, it means that thousands of people were exposed to toxic chemicals, and it was disproportionately impacting those underrepresented poor communities who were unable to relocate or access adequate health care. They were unable to fight for their rights or for compensation in court with Union Carbide afterwards. That's why it's an example of environmental injustice. Maasai land rights in Kenya and Tanzania are another example of environmental injustice. The Maasai are indigenous pastoralists in East Africa who wander around the landscape or who follow their livestock across the landscape. And they, like elephants, contribute to maintaining the savanna ecosystems that are so popular for safaris. They have been and continue to be forcibly removed from their ancestral lands. That means they have lost access to grazing lands and water sources needed to keep their livestock. They bear the cost of conservation in creating all these national parks and opportunities for safari businesses, while the wealthy tourists benefit from the conservation of biodiversity and the business of those safaris goes to government agencies and wealthy business owners. It's causing a real change in the culture of the Maasai, another case study of environmental justice. Another case study of environmental injustice is the way that plastic waste disposal from developed countries ends up in developing countries. This shifts the environmental burden from MEDCs to LEDCs. It exposes vulnerable people to health risks and pollution that MEDCs are able to just shunt to the side. As we've seen in some of these case studies, inequalities lead to disparities in access to food, water, and energy. Factors that contribute to these inequalities include income, race, gender, and cultural identity. These disparities exist both within and between different societies. Here in this picture, we see that there is inequitable access to fresh water in South Africa. This inequality is based on disparities in race and income. Black households are much more likely to experience shortages than white households. This has an historical basis in the apartheid regime that dominated South Africa for so many years. Another example of environmental injustice is food access in the UK. In the United Kingdom, we see increasing food bank usage primarily focused in low-income families, especially single-parent households that are led by women. In Lebanon, access to energy is tremendously unequal. There's a very wealthy class that can afford to pay for petrol and generators, and so they have reliable electricity. There's an economic crisis that has led to severe power shortages, but because wealthy people have access to those generators, they don't really suffer from it as much. But poorer families face up to 22 hours every day without electricity. That impacts their ability to work, it impacts their ability to study, it impacts their access to healthcare, it impacts overall their quality of life. Sustainability and environmental justice apply at multiple scales. It ranges from individual action in your local community to global initiatives that require international partnerships. In this slide, to use these, use these shapes to show how 
each of these scales of sustainability and environmental justice are nested within the largest. At the global scale, the UN Sustainable Development Goals and international agreements such as the Montreal Protocol and the Kyoto Accord provide a global framework for sustainability. At a national scale, you may see government policies about renewable energy incentives, tax incentives to make renewable energy preferable over fossil fuel, over electricity generated through fossil fuels. Within the regional business or community scale, you may have corporate recycling programs or zero waste initiatives. And then individually, personal choices like using public transportation or adopting plant-based diets are a way for individual people to make a difference in terms of sustainability. In the next video, we're going to look at measuring sustainability and models for measuring sustainability around the world.